Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of our ongoing Gates Air Connect webinar series. Today's webinar, Broadcast Antennas and Transmission, is presented to you by Gates Air's Steve Rossiter, Applications Engineer for our Television Products Group. That said, this webinar will be useful for both TV and radio broadcasters alike, and we are sure that you'll find a wealth of great information in today's presentation. So before we start today's webinar, we will take a quick three minute break to allow latecomers to join and, and partake in the fun as well. So in the meantime, please sit back and relax and we'll see you in three. Thanks. All right. Hello again, everyone, and welcome once more to the Gates Air Connect webinar series. This is Keith Adams, Marketing Communications Manager for Gates Air, and I'd like to say thanks for attending. Uh, today's webinar is going to be a really good one. Um, it's brought to you by Popular Demand. Uh, this one is Broadcast Antennas and Transmission, and it'll be presented by Gates Air's own Steve Rossiter, Applications Engineer for our Television Products Group. Uh, this webinar will cover a wide range of topics and technical information aimed at both television and radio broadcasters who are interested in the ins and outs of antenna design and choosing the right one for your station. So get ready for a really, really interesting one today. As always, a question and answer session will take place at the conclusion of the presentation. We'll be fielding uh, maybe a couple questions that came in from email but we really encourage you to enter in any questions that you might have in the live chat or top chat section directly under this video or if you're watching this directly in youtube it's directly to the right of the video i think so uh anyway we'll be answering them in a first come first serve manner so feel free to enter them in when you feel like it 
So all that said, uh, let's get this webinar start started and uh, allow me to hand it over to Mr. Steve Rossiter. Steve? All right, thanks guys. Um, I look forward to, uh, to talking with you guys. Um, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna talk out, we're gonna start off kinda, kinda basic and then we're gonna build it up from there. So the first thing I kinda wanted to say is, is we're gonna be talking about antennas and we're gonna be talking about what is an antenna, what's the things that we need to be thinking about. Uh, so we'll start off with, what, you know, what is, a, what is an antenna? Well, an antenna is basically, it's a transducer designed to transmit and receive electron, electromagnetic waves. So as we think about broadcast, you know, we're gonna radiate energy into space basically, and we're going to receive energy into space. Well. When we look at antennas, all antennas, regardless of their shape and size, have four basic characteristics. One is reciprocity. Next one is directivity. And then we have gain. And then we have polarization. So reciprocity, for example, um, the, is the, the antenna's ability to transfer energy from a transmitter to the atmosphere with the same efficiency in which it transfers energy from the atmosphere to the receiver. Almost all antennas will receive just as well as they transmit. So looking at that, okay, then we get to that next step and we start talking about directivity. So a directivity, you know, of an antenna is the measure of the antenna's ability to focus energy in one or more specific directions. And you can determine an, an, an antenna's directivity by looking at its radiation patterns. And specifically, that would be like the elevation pattern, or the azimuth pattern, okay? Antennas can be designed to focus energy in one direction, or they can be designed to focus energy in what we call an omnidirectional, so all directions. Um, like a, if you think about it, if you think about like a flashlight, you know, everybody's played with the flashlight and you change the beam either wider or smaller. Well, antennas doing the same thing. So if we say it's directional, instead of being, you know, you know, all over the place it's actually focused into one real tight beam okay unlike a lantern if you think about a lantern it lights up a whole large area that would be considered omnidirectional so the next thing that we talked about earlier is this gain okay you know directivity is is one thing but gain is taking into account the ratio between the amount of energy propagated in one direction okay, a directional antenna, and the energy that would be propagated if the antenna were non-directional. Omnidirectional antennas is known as antenna gain, or I'm sorry, omnidirectional antenna or, or gain in reference to the, two, the two different ones. So effective area, we're gonna move on a little bit. Relative physical size and shape of the antenna. Frequency and gain determines the size of the antenna. Okay, so the lower the frequency, the larger the antenna needs to be. The higher the gain, the larger the antenna also needs to be. So, and I have this nice formula here so you guys can see it and kind of understand this is what goes into determining the size and the gain of antenna. So the next thing was polarization. The electromagnetic radiation from an antenna is made up of two components, an E field or an H field. The E field is the electric lines of force. The H field is the magnetic lines of force. Polarization is the direction of the electric field and is the same as the physical attitude of the antennas. So basically what we're saying is a vertical antenna will transmit a vertical polarized wave. A horizontal antenna will transmit a horizontally polarized wave. The receivers and the transmit antennas need to be in the same uh, position or same polarization to be able to communicate with each other or receive those elect electromagnetic waves. So this gives you a, a kind of a better idea, a visual view of this. You know, a directional, a di the direction of the polarization is the direction of the electronic vector. That is the elect electric lines of force are horizontal. So we can see those electric lines of force are horizontal. The wave is said to be a horizontally polarized. So if we go to vertical, now the electric lines of force are, are vertical. You can see that here. 
okay? And the wave is said to be vertically polarized. And you can see we have a vertical antenna and vertical lines of force. So, but with a lot of antennas today, especially as we look at the different modulations that are out there, um, we're actually using both a, a vertical polarization as well as a horizontal polarization. Okay, and this is for both TV and FM. FM typically we'll see a, like a circular polarized, and then in TV we'll typically see elliptically polarized. And the when we look at elliptical or circular polarization, we're actually adding energy to both fields or both electric fields. And it's described as elliptical circular or, or the, the electric vector at one point in time describes the helix along that direction of the wave. So as we go go on and start looking at, you know, how do we how do we look at antennas and antenna types? The really the first one we want to really want to look at is the isotropic antenna. And the isotropic antenna is a theoretical antenna that has a perfect 360 degree vertical and horizontal beam width. An isotropic antenna is a reference for all antennas and this is theoretical only. So what are the most, some of the most common antennas out there? Well, the dipole antennas. You know, we've got a half wave dipole antenna, or we call a Hertz antenna, or a quarter wave vertical antenna, or a Marconi antenna. Okay, now the gain of a dipole antenna is 2.14 dBi, based upon the isotropic, compared to zero dBd of, of the dipole. So broadcast antennas. This just gives you a, a depiction of <clears throat> a half wave dipole antenna and kind of showing you uh, the reflector and, and the dipole portion of it. So as we look at additional vertical polarization or dipole antenna or horizontal, typical FM or TV antenna, we can see that if I don't have a reflector on the back, so we can show you this, this is a reflector. If I don't have a reflector, it really looks like a donut. And this is a vertical antenna. If I turned it off to its side, it would also be a horizontal antenna and would be the same pattern. If we put a reflector behind it, you can see that we start getting some, you know, uh, beams that come off of that and we have a little back lobe, okay? And that's because of that reflector. So we're trying to focus that energy in one direction. So as we look at different types of antennas, broadcast antenna types, you know, panel antennas are, are ones that's most common antenna used worldwide. Um, so, and there are many, many different styles of panel antennas. Uh, as you can see, there's one with a flat radiator. The next one is a cavity back radiator. We have some UHF antennas, and you can see the big picture on the side with some very large antennas. The average panel antenna, or the advantages, typically designed to a wide band and can be used for a number of channels or stations. Um, directional or omnidirectional patterns typically are available for, for these uh, panel style antennas. And we can do panel style antennas in VHF, uh, low band, mid band, uh, FM, and high band, uh, UHF, and so on. So the disadvantages of a panel antenna is typically they're large in size uh, and have high wind loads. Uh, you know, the mechanical loading on the tower can be, can be detrimental to some towers, especially an old tower. Um, uh, and can the feed systems themselves and the complexity of the antenna uh, can be very, very complex and very expensive, you know, especially when you're talking about large systems that are designed with very high gains or if you start adding vertical and horizontal polarization into the same antenna. So as we, as we look at a simple, a simple antenna um, panel type, you can see that on the horizontal or vertical polarization, we have a pretty complex feed system. So because if it's a, you know, a panel, I've got the single input that you see here, and then I go from there, I split to another, and then I split, and then I finally get to the panels after I split a number of times. But that's one feed, okay? From there, you know, I go and look at if I'm adding 
um, elliptically polarized antenna or a, a uh, circular polarized antenna, then I end up possibly having two feeds, which becomes even more complex. And then as we add complexity to an antenna, we add expense. That's one thing to always think about. So as you can see in the next one, where I said it's horizontal and vertical polarized, whether it's elliptical or, or circular, I still have to have you know, additional cost to go in that. OK, because not only do I have additional cost in the feed system, but I also have additional cost in the the panels themselves, because I've got to have two different dipoles in there, one in a vertical component, and one in a horizontal component. So one of the ways to help reduce some costs and also give you, you know, a really good antenna is to use a slotted style. And typical slotted style consists of a metal surface, usually a flat plate or a pole, um, with a hole or a slot cut out. When the plate is driven as an antenna by a driving frequency, the slot radiates electromagnetic waves, you know, similar to the waves of a dipole. The shape and size of that slot, as well as the driving frequency, determine the radiation distribution of the pattern. Now, we can add fins to a slotted antenna to give you directional uh, patterns or non-directional patterns. And the same thing goes with uh, a slot antenna that you can have, you know, horizontal, elliptical, or circular polarization. And as you can see down here on the, the, the bottom picture right here, you can see that this is a, sl a typical slot, and but it has a, a little... Uh, antenna or a dipole sitting off the front that gives you that vertical polarization that I'm talking about and it would be a percentage of the vertical polarization so an example for TV typically that would be 70 percent um, horizontal and 30 percent vertical is a very common numbers so uh, advantages to a slot antenna less weight less wind loads on the tower and due to the shape it's it's a pole um, Directional and omni, you know, azimuth patterns are possible. Uh, disadvantages of a slot. Typical narrow band, you know, single channel operation uh, due to the resonant frequency of the slot. And in order to change a frequency, you'd have to really change the slot. And in most cases, you're changing the whole pole. So you replace the antenna if you have to put a different frequency into it. So... There are other antennas out there. There's thousands of different styles of antennas that you can find. Uh, a couple of them that we use commonly in broadcast, super turnstile antenna or a bat wing. Um, those are typically horizontally polarized. Um, and the, the dipole, it's a still a dipole antenna. Now, the one thing about patterns is you're limited on the number of patterns that you can have for a, a super turnstile or bat wing style antenna. Uh, and, but they can do them in low band, uh, mid band, uh, high band, and also in UHF. So the other the other style that's commonly used in uh, broadcast is a helical style antenna, and those are typically you know circular polarized. Advantages: super turn style antennas and helical antennas are less weight, less wind load on a tower due to their shape. Um, they're broadband and can be used for multiple channels. Uh, disadvantages, super turnstiles uh, and helical antennas, like panel antennas, are complex um, and usually have a pretty high cost. Um, they're limited on azimuth patterns. Typically, Omni, you can do some peanut patterns with the super turnstiles, but typically um, most of them are Omni. So let's talk a little bit about propagation um, because with TV and FM, you know, our Typical propagation is line of sight, but there's a number of different uh, propagations that can be looked at for um, antennas. So radio propagation is a term used to explain how radio waves behave when they are transmitted or propagated from one point on the earth to another point on the earth. So we have ground wave propagation, sky wave propagation, and line of sight propagation. So as we look at ground wave propagation, that follows the contour of the Earth, and it propagates considerable distances, frequencies typically to 2 megahertz. An example, AM radio. If we look at sky wave propagation, the signals reflected from the, the 
ionis layer of the atmosphere back down to Earth, signal can travel a number of hops back and forth between the ionosphere and the Earth's surface. So reflections affect caused by refraction. An example, amateur radio, citizens band radio, and that. So we get to line of sight propagation. Transmitting and receiving antenna needs to be within line of sight. Uh, the satellite communication signal above 300 megahertz not reflected by ionosphere. Ground communication um, antennas with effective lines of sight due to refraction. And examples is satellite communication, FM radio, TV, and cell phone communications is also line of sight. So one of the th the um, Examples of line of sight formulas uh, is optical line of sight. We have the formula right there. Uh, the effective or radio line of sight is also for it. But do we add another, another component to that? As you can see, down below, we have the distance between the antenna and the horizon in kilometers. We have the height in meters. And then we have the adjustment factor to account for refraction. The rule of thumb is typically a 1.33 factor. We call that a K factor. So if we look at line of sight, and I'm going to look at both sides of it. So I want to look at my transmit antenna, you know, and I want to look at my receive antenna, and I want to take into account the heights of both of those. So I've provided the formula here for that as well. And you can put this into Excel or any type of, uh, you know, a spreadsheet program, and it makes it very easy to do this quick calculation to give you an idea of what height you need to have your antenna and what height, you know, you can compare that to your receive antenna. So another important thing is effective radiated power. And this is how much power the antenna is actually directing in a specific direction. Okay, so effective radiated power and the gain of the antenna multiplied together in dB added together, okay, um, is multiplied together or added in dB for if you add those together. So we got the two formulas there. We got the ERP, uh, we have the power in watts times the gain, and we have the ERP in dB, the, the power in watts in dB, and then we plus that or, or add that to the gain. So this is the formulas for that. Now, the one thing I didn't take into account on this formula was losses. An example would be, you know, losses for transmission line or the antenna feed system. Um, those losses are not included in this formula, but we can add those basically by, if you put them in dB, we can subtract those losses or we can divide it uh, with our, with our uh, gain and our watts to get it the other way. So another good calculation to know is, is wavelengths, okay? So as you can see, we have the speed of light and wavelength is the length of the signal. So we have the speed of light over the frequency. So this is where I really wanted to get to, to really talk about patterns. Um, we have two different style of patterns that most antenna companies will provide you, okay? And those patterns are a graphical representation of the radiation properties of an antenna. It illustrates two dimensions or cross sections of an azimuth and elevation pattern. So I want you to think of an azimuth pattern sort of like a wafer. You know, we're only looking at a, a very, you know, thin slice of the antenna, you know, uh, radiation pattern. We're looking at, in this case, we're looking at the the highest point, um, and that would be the peak of the beam if you're looking at the elevation pattern. We're looking at a, just a slice of that, okay? Now, as I look at different slices, that pattern changes based upon the antenna design. And as you can see, if you look at the elevation pattern, as I ch look at the azimuth and elevation and I change space or go to a different slice, you can see where the power will go up and down based upon the relative field of those patterns. So the elevation pattern is the same way, okay? It is a thin slice. It's only looking at basically, you know, one direction. Um, and typically that is at the highest point. And you can see where you have the, the peak of the beam going out towards the horizon. Now, the peak of the beam looks like it's going up right now. So another way of looking at that is to look at it a different way and turn it sideways and actually look at that. So we'll do that shortly. 
But I also want to say, we'll go back to the azimuth patterns and say, okay, now we have two different styles of pattern. We have a directional and we have a non-directional, okay? And as you can see, that non-directional pattern still has some lobes and things like that in it. Depending on the antenna type, okay, that those, those lobes or areas that you see that are sunk in will change, okay? And you know, when you're looking at Omni, they could be completely around or very close to it. Because remember, there's no such thing as an isotropic. It's only used for, um, um, you know, as a theoretical antenna. So nothing's ever perfect. But we can get close, especially with like a slotted antenna and that kind of thing. You can get more Omni. Uh, directional patterns typically used to focus energy in a specific location or not focus energy in a specific location. An example, if you're going up you're like towards Canada or someplace like that, we don't want to, we don't want to add a bunch of energy over into our neighbors. So we use directional antennas to keep that power from propagating over into their area. So elevation pattern, elevation patterns, you know, we have two different things that we need to think about when we're looking at elevation patterns. One is beam tilt. And the other one is an all felt. So we're going to talk about beam tilt just a little bit first. Beam tilt is used to aim the main lobe of a vertical plane radiation pattern of an antenna below or above the horizon or plane. The simplest way is to mechanically beam tilt. Basically, you physically tilt the whole antenna down, okay, on one side where the antenna is physically mounted on the tower at an angle and the signal on the signal side. And however, this raises it on the other side. So you got to keep in mind, as you look at the back side of that, as you tilt it one way, the other way is going to go up. So we're sending power out into space. Okay. Uh, more commonly is electrical beam tilt, where the phasing of the antenna, okay, between the elements are adjusted to make the signal to go up or down. So earlier I said some of the easiest ways to understand an elevation pattern is actually turn it on its side and look at it based upon here is my my center line or towards the horizon okay and look at that elevation pattern and say okay if i add beam tilt this is what i'm doing to drop below the horizon so you can see the peak of the beam is now five degrees below the horizon instead of at the horizon okay so known beam tilt and we're going to include beam tilt so this is an easy way to look at elevation patterns, especially when you first look at a pattern from an antenna provider. You can look at it, turn it sideways, take a quick look. Say, ah, I see what he's doing. So the other thing about elevation patterns is pattern null fill. And, and this is used in the antenna systems, um, which are located at high altitude locations or tall towers or populated areas close to the tower to prevent too much of the signal from overshooting the nearest part or intended coverage area. This is phasing is used between the antenna elements to take power away from the main lobe and electrically direct more of it downward, angle it in the vertical plane. And this requires a phased array. Changing the relative power supplied to each element also changes the radiation pattern in this manner. And often both phasing and power split can be used in combination to get you more or less null fill. And this can be done with any type of antenna um, you know, whether it be a slotted antenna or a uh, panel antenna or even FM antennas. Okay, so what are we really doing with null fill? Well, what we're doing is we're stealing some power. We're actually taking the power from the main beam and we're adding that out into the first, second, and third nulls. Okay, and we can you can actually go farther than that, but typically the first, second, third nulls are the most important. So what we do is we steal a little bit of power from the main beam. The main beam gets a little bit wider, okay, and my gain goes down. So we're, when we take power away from it, our gain is reduced, and we add some power to those nulls, lifting them up. So if someone is living close to the tower, they actually get a little bit more signal strength, okay, um, you know, because we've added that null fill in there. So the goal is, is to add the right amount of null fill for the antenna to get the, to get the coverage that you're looking for. So, so one of the ways of doing that is to look at field strength versus distance plots. Okay. And these are a graphical representation of the effects of null fill and beam tilt. 
you know, an effective radiative power or ERP and the height of the antenna above the average terrain on the amount of signal that can be obtained at a specific distance from the antenna. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at what happens when we adjust null fill and beam tilt, what happens to the, the patterns. So if we go looking at the elevation pattern, for example, and we just look at zero null fill, zero beam tilt, we have an ERP that's equal to 25 kilowatts, and we have a height above average terrain of about 200 meters. So we're going to show you this average. This is our, our uh, uh, field strength versus distance plot. And as you can see, the distance to the horizon is 58.3. And I says the angle to the horizon is about, you know, about 0.4 degrees. So as you can see, this first null that you see right here is actually represented right here. Okay, the second null is right here. So once we get to that second null, it's really so close. It's within one kilometer of the tower. So it's really close. So we're not really concerned so much about, you know, the third null. Right now, we're really concerned about this first and second null. But as you can see, the, the power goes up and then it comes drops back down quite considerably. And then it comes back up again. And now we're back into the, this is the actual main beam. We're back in the main beam and we come back up and over. So you can see this is a graphical representation of that. As we as we look at what happens when we add null fill, uh, for example, to an elevation pattern. So here's my elevation pattern. And then as I look at this, I start adding null fill. This is my no null fill with the red lines. And if I look at the blue, you can see that when I add null fill, I actually increase the power at this point. So the, the people living at two kilometers or so from the tower actually get more signal because they are not sitting in a null anymore, okay? And, and think about it this way, is if, if your station was sitting and your, 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 your GM is sitting there listening to his radio or watching his TV program and he's in that null, okay, because you got the wrong antenna or didn't add null fill to the antenna that you had, and he may or may not get a signal, and I said, and that would be that would be really bad to have if your if your your station couldn't receive their own signal. So if you think about that with customers, the customers is the same way. We want to make sure that your customers get a signal in those areas, especially if they're close to the tower. So as we look at what happens when we use beam tilt, so. Same elevation pattern. The only difference is, is we don't have any null fill. We just, we just move the beam around. We basically lowered the beam so it, it's actually slightly below the horizon. So what happens is, is you can see that what, when we move that and we tilted that beam down, we also move this first null in. So we also move the second null in and so on and so forth. So these got moved actually in back towards the tower. So let's say your studio was here, okay? By adding beam tilt, we actually move this null back. So now your studio's got a lot of signal or whoever's in that two kilometer range actually gets a lot more signal. So if your tower is sitting just outside of town and you want to make sure from anywhere from two kilometers on, you get a good signal, Beam tilt is one way of doing that by keeping the, the beam actually in where your population is. So you can add beam tilt to actually move the nulls around. So if we use a combination of both null fill and beam tilt, the two, you know, then I can both move the null, move it back, and increase it too. So let's say my population started at one kilometer away from the tower and anything past it, I wanted to make sure I had good signal. So I use a combination of both null fill and beam tilt, okay, to move the null back and to raise the power up in that null to make sure that people that are living close to that one and a half kilometer mark are actually getting signal. So that's another way of looking at it okay, and getting power to where you want it. Now, as with anything, there's a downfall. If you can see, I lost a little bit of distance on it because remember, I'm turning the beam down, so I'm going to lose a little distance. I'm also stealing a small amount of power from that main beam, 
okay? And when I steal that little bit of power, I actually reduce how far it's going to go, okay? Um, ways of the other ways of getting around that reduction is to add height. If you can add more height to a tower, that's one way of doing it. So, uh, so the next thing we can look at is look at power. You know, raw power. Everybody thinks that more power is better. You know, it's not necessarily true. More power is not always better. Um, does it help? Absolutely. So. As we can see, if we have an ERP of 25 kilowatts, a height above average train of 200 meters, beam tilt to zero, null fill zero, and then we compare that to an ERP of five kilowatts, okay, uh, with a height above average train of 200 meters, you can see that the nulls in the same place, the only difference really is we have a, a reduction in power overall, but it's not as big as people would think as you can see here in this graphical representation of that. So now let's look at height. If I keep the power the same and I say, look at null fill and I look at beam tilt and I say, okay, I don't really need null fill and beam tilt, but um, I need to go higher in, in my antenna. The higher, the higher it up it goes, the better off we are. And as you can see here, adding height, okay, actually increases everything up. And this is except right here where that null shifted back because I'm lower, I get a little increase of power here, but overall, you know, increasing height actually helps you. So if I look at all the variables that go into, you know, an antenna and looking at null fill, looking at beam tilt, looking at polarization, and looking at what we're doing for repack today. There's a lot of things that, that we can do uh, when it comes to antennas, especially when it comes to null fill and beam tilt, to really help get you better coverage. And, it's, and one of the, the other things that I wanted to point out as we were talking about antennas is, is what goes into doing coverage. Okay, for an example, ATSC coverage is based on the following variables. Antenna height above average terrain, the antenna gain, the length and the size of the transmission line and losses, um, you know, RF system losses, okay, um, and transmitter power. The last thing is signal to noise ratio, okay? So as we look at all these, these variables and we start looking at the balance um, of an antenna compared to the the transmitter, it's really a balance of everything. Um, you don't want the beam to be too narrow. You don't want too much null fill, you know, where you're stealing too much away from the main beam. You you want to add um, a little bit of, of beam tilt to make sure that you're actually directing the beam towards the horizon, okay? So you, you get as much coverage as you can. And, and there's a huge difference between coverage and power too. Okay, because if you look at the plot that we have here in front of us, it's a field strength coverage plot. You'll notice that there's a blue line that goes around there. That's our 41 dB microvolt per meter line. Okay, and that's what the FCC says. Well, this is what power you can have. Okay, and, and, and we're limited by that 41 dB microvolt per meter circle, basically. Um, but that doesn't represent coverage. And as we look at different modulations and we look at, you know, other things, coverage will change, okay, uh, based upon all these variables and based upon that signal to noise ratio. So in the end, um, everything is, everything that we look at from an antenna standpoint um, and a transmission line standpoint and a transmitter power standpoint is a balance of all three of those, okay? Um, this is this is it at this point. I wanted to know if you guys had any questions that we can talk about at this point. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, before we dive into those questions, uh, I'll do a quick bit of housekeeping here. Um, please enter your questions into the live chat or top chat section below or to the right of this video, and we're going to answer them in a first come, first serve manner. Um, I see at least one. Uh, that Mr. 37 has put out. We'll get to that one shortly. But um, 
um, for radio broadcasters that might be interested in audio over IP STL transport, um, we'd love to have you join us two weeks from now on Thursday, August 30th, as we present a webinar on the ever popular Intraplex IP Link 100, presented by Gates of Air's own Tony Gervasi. Um, this webinar is going to provide background and operational info on the IP Link 100, including some tips and tricks on reliable AO. IP deployment, signal monitoring, and, and other things. Uh, and info on this webinar can be found at gatesair.com slash webinars. Um, you should be able to register there. We're going to send out an email blast here soon. Um, this particular antennas webinar will be available here on gatesair.com and on our YouTube channel later today. We record them all, and hopefully you'll have a chance to look back and, and uh, re-enjoy this presentation. The same links that you use to view it um, should work for viewing the recording. So it's all good. Uh, in addition, we're going to be adding this webinar to our educational video library at gatesairuniversity.com, our online hub of lessons and webinars about broadcast engineering. And if you haven't already, we encourage you to visit and browse through a lot of really great material there at gatesairuniversity.com. Um, so now, on to the questions. Uh, first, uh, one from email that we got earlier um, this week. A guy named Marshall Zahn asked the question, if I get a high-gain antenna for my station to reduce my transmitter power, what effects can I expect? Okay. Um, well, the best way to answer this question is to, you know, first of all, you know, you can get a high gain antenna to help reduce transmitter power. The the problems with high gain antennas, especially if you get very, very high gain antennas, is, is the beam of the elevation pattern actually gets much smaller. Um, and when you get much smaller, then effects of the tower, how it sways in the wind and things like that can actually cause beam sway. That's one thing where you're, you know, you're actually bouncing that beam up and down from the horizon. And also, it has an effect on coverage. You can actually overshoot your customers. Uh, so when you have a small beam like that um, with a high-gain antenna, uh, you know, that's, that it's not going to help you as much as if you had a wider beam, okay, where you can get the, the power actually down to uh, – your customers and things like that. So uh, there's 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 advantages um, to having finding that that balance of antenna gain and antenna size and transmitter power. So uh, just increasing gain of the antenna to reduce the transmitter power is it can help, but you don't want to carry it overboard. You want to make sure you find that balance. So and that's how I would uh, explain that. Okay. Um, Mr. 137 um, states, how does the impedance of free space affect the design of an antenna? The impedance of free space? <laughs> well, um, I would have to, I'd have to, you know, pass on that question at this point because I really don't have a, have a, the exact answer of that other than, you know, you have propagation losses uh, you know, so as the antenna is is transforming the energy from the from the electromagnetic or the electromagnetic energy from the antenna out, uh, you're going to have propagation losses through that. Typically, you know, we we look at propagation losses based upon a 50 ohm antenna. So uh, at this point, I I can't answer that other than that. Well, you answered better than I would have been able to because I'm just in marketing. So. Um, but that said, uh, Jim DeFilippis, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, uh, with a panel type antenna, can you optimize the tilt for each face independently? The answer to that question is yes, you can. Um, because a panel style antenna um, is designed using a feed system, you and each one of those feed systems kind of splits, it's like a branch of a tree. Um, when you get to the panel itself, you can actually adjust the phase 
of one face of that tower, okay, or of your antenna array, and give it, an example, more beam tilt, so let's say two degrees, as you can on the opposite side of that. This is, the only downfall to that is you do get some odd things that go on between faces. If I have if I have four faces of an antenna and one of them has two degrees of beam tilt and the other one has one degree of beam tilt, well, when they come together in the middle, they can do some odd things sometimes. And you may not get the result that you think uh, when you do that, you know, multiple beam tilts in a panel antenna. But the answer to your question overall is yes, you can. And we change the phase of the each individual panel to get the different beam tilts. Sky4 uh, has a question about ATSC 3.0. Uh, for oh. ATSC 3.0, do you have, uh, or sorry, do you have to have both vertical and horizontal capable antennas? The answer, the answer is yes and no. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because do I have to have uh, elliptical polarization or, you know, horizontal and vertical for ATSC3? Well, the answer is no, I don't have to have it. And I says, but would I get better reception from a customer standpoint if I had a both a vertical and horizontal component? Well, the answer would be yes. And the reasoning is this, okay, because it's an OFDM modulation, okay, you really do want multi-paths in a OFDM modulation. So as the as the the signal propagates from the antenna, okay, it bounces off of things, okay? And when it bounces off of things, that gives you multipaths. So having a vertical component and a horizontal component gives you more multipaths and more multipaths actually give you better better signal strength at the receivers. Let's go to one from the email. Uh, Rodney Welton asks the question, um, I'm having a broadband slot installed for my auxiliary antenna. Um, and uh, most slotted style antennas are narrow banded is what I've heard. What is the difference? Um, well, the difference is, is a broadband slot, okay, um, is just a term used for a very a, a design of panel antenna it's actually a cavity radiator with a a dipole element um but it's only one side so typically you'll see those and they'll have like an omni uh, a skull style pattern um it's actually a dipole antenna uh similar to a panel uh because of the way it's designed it allows the to be broadband and because of the size they call it a a they call it a you know, a slot antenna, it's actually still just a, 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 a style of panel antenna. And I call it, I really call it a hybrid. I, it's sort of a hybrid between the two uh, mm -hmm. because of the way it's fed. And there you have it. Um, Ron Krauss asks, um, he wants, wants you to talk about half versus full wave spacing between bays. Well, you know, if you look at full wave spacing, you know, it's really a matter of changing. It changes the gain value of an over, overall antenna array. Uh, as you move the spacing closer, your gain will typically go down. Um, there are advantages to that, especially if you've got a tower with limited space where you can go to a half wave spacing. Uh, but you pay a price for that as you as you reduce the spacing between elements of any antenna, you also reduce the gain of that antenna. And it goes back to that formula that I give you in the beginning of the presentation is the, where the size of the antenna, okay, uh, also helps determine the gain of the antenna. Okay. Um, this isn't really a question, but an observation from uh, one of the watchers listeners uh rick Pittman mentions that he noticed using a higher gain antenna and reducing power reduced signal penetration into large uh concrete structural buildings in his coverage area um is do, do you uh agree, what, what would you say uh, to that observation 
go ahead and repeat that again. That so he, be- uh, he said he noticed um, using higher gain antennas um, and reducing power would reduce the signal penetration into large concrete structural buildings in his coverage area. And that may be the case. You got to remember a concrete building or any building of sorts, it's like trying to transmit into a mountain. So as you as you try to propagate a signal through concrete and glass and all that stuff, uh, it re, it attenuates the signal very considerably. Typical indoor signal reduction can be you know 11, 12 dB, um, and then when you look at differences in height, and you look at differences in and there you can have as much as 35 dB reduction. Looking doing a comparison between indoor coverage and outdoor coverage. So when you start looking at, you know, coverage and trying to get penetration into buildings, you know, think about it like like penetrating a mountain. I mean, it's it's it, it's a tough thing to do. And that's the reason why we use gap fillers and we add additional transmitters with smaller antennas in strategic locations to get into these buildings or into these indoor locations. Um and that helps increase the signal strength and helps increase your coverage. That makes sense. Um, M. Silva asks, um, are all these antenna adjustments that you speak of, um, are they done by the factory manufacturer, factory or the manufacturer, or are they field adjustable? Well, most antennas really need to be adjusted uh, by the manufacturer. Uh, to be honest, you know, there are, they are very technical and they can get very complex. Um, you know, a slotted antenna, for example, um, you know, that has coupler bars and it has, you know, the inner conductor that goes up through the pipe and there's a lot to do with it. Okay. So trying to make adjustments in the field, it's not necessarily a good idea. Now, has it been done? If you start looking at panel antennas and you look at some bat wing antennas and those style of antennas where the feed systems and those things are outside or able to be accessed, they have done them in the field. But it is problematic. You're, you know, it's always best to do any type of maintenance or, or adjustments to an antenna in the factory. Better to be safe than sorry. Well, Keith, I'll have you. I'll have you answer that question because, as far as I'm concerned, they're welcome to them. Okay, um, we'll we'll have a PDF prepared, and this will uh, we'll make sure that they're available um, at gatesair.com/slash/media/center/slash/presentations. Um, and again, you uh, at the end of this presentation, we'll. Um, have some emails that from which you can contact us um and th- there actually is another question that just came in well two questions that just came in i can answer one of them uh it's from jim mcgowan uh i had to leave for an emergency and didn't get a chance to view the entire webinar um can it be replayed on demand uh again the answer is yes and we try to record um as many of these as possible you can actually revisit the same link that you're using to watch this one and uh, it should be recorded and available shortly after the end of this presentation. Um, we also will have it at uh, hopefully next week, early next week at gatesairuniversity.com as well. But always on our YouTube channel, you can, you can see pretty much all of the webinars under the webinars playlist. Um, but here's a couple questions. Back to you, Steve. Um, KJIW Radio asks, um, if you have noise or picket fencing, at your 60 dBU, what would cause that and how can you fix it? Hmm. I guess there's a number of things that could cause it, so I don't really know any specifics. It seems kind of, yeah, yeah. like a lot of things. Um, you know, I've seen in the past um, where, we've, where they've had noise issues. Uh, it was caused actually by, you know, you know, other, other obstacles such as uh, wind turbines and things like that, that were in the area, um, which caused some interference issues. Um, You may be getting interference issues from other stations. You know, an example would be, you know, when we look at like channel 14 or something like that, you have land mobile down below. And sometimes, you know, 
um, you can get, you know, adjacent channel interferences and things like that. But I, I really wouldn't know your specific situation. But the nice thing is if you want to contact us and uh, learn a little bit more and have some of our, our, our support team come out, is that, is that a possibility? Well, that's always a possibility. But one of the things that we can do too, and you know, understand we are a transmitter company. We're not an antenna company. Okay. Uh, and I rely heavily on the, the antenna companies that we have and do business with. Um, so, you know, if you have a question like that and you think uh, w one of the antenna companies uh, can help you with that, I would be v more than happy to get you in touch with any one of them. Uh, so we, that way we can discuss it and see if we can't help you out. And that, that is Steve Rossiter, ladies and gentlemen, he is, uh, he's, he's, he's a good guy. Um, but also they, that that's, and that's an awesome point that we, we definitely try to partner with people throughout the RF chain and, and Steve has really good understanding, not only of the, you know, the technology, but a lot of the people who are really hands on in, into it. So that, that's, that's an awesome connection. I would strongly recommend you contact him. Um, Carlos Delgado asks the question, uh, which is, what's the maximum separation uh, to transmit two channels on the same antenna? Well, that would be that would be dependent on the antenna, uh, because you can put adjacent channels uh, through an antenna, whether it be a slotted antenna that's tuned a little bit wider, or a panel antenna. You can put two channels adjacent to each other through that antenna. Typically, how you keep a separation between the two is actually done down lower in the RF system. It's actually done at the RF filter. So as you start looking at um, the type of mask filters that are needed, an, an example for TV, uh, we would use typically for adjacent channels, we'd use eight pole mask filters to give us a, a good separation of power between the two, two channels. Uh, if we look at FM, you know, for example, um, typically we would use a, a different style of filter, but it would still be the filter itself that is actually giving you the separation between the two channels. So the antennas really don't care. Um, it's really the filtering before you ever get to the antenna that really does all that work. Good filter is very helpful. Um, Timothy Dorm asks what uh, could be the final question as we approach the top of the hour. Um, what level is considered a high gain antenna? Is 45 high? Um, 45, as far as a value is concerned, is pretty high, yes. Uh, typical for TV, or, and, you know, we, I'm going to address TV because that's where, you know, I do a lot of, of work at. Typically, I like to keep the gain, you know, 24 and less. And the reasoning is, is to keep the beam as wide as possible. Now, your situation may be different uh, and you require a high gain antenna for a specific reason. Uh, but typically, you know, I like to keep the beam fairly wide. Uh, so I, I limit it to about a 24 value and, and go from there. All right. Um... Again, uh, we don't want to keep people past uh, the hour that we ordinarily set these webinars for. Um, so uh, first, I want, to, I want to thank you, Steve, again, uh, so much for presenting all of this. We definitely, definitely appreciate uh, the great information you put out there. Um, if people wanted to get in touch with you, as I know at least a couple of people did in these questions that you graciously answered, um, how would they do so? A like good email address. To reach um, you can contact me, you know, basically on my Gates Air email address, and that is s r o s s i t e at gatesair.com, or it's Stephen dot r o s s s i t e r at gatesair.com. Either email address will work. Uh, you can also contact me by phone as well. My number is two one seven. 
Excellent. Thank you. And uh, so before we go, a uh, quick reminder that this webinar recording will be available again here on gazeair.com and on our YouTube channel using the same links you used to view the live presentation. And um, it'll also appear at gatesairuniversity.com. And please visit that site if you get a chance and let us know what you think. In fact, if any of you have any topic ideas for future webinars that you'd like to see, including some course material for gatesairuniversity.com, uh, please let us know at marketing at gatesair.com. Or you can email me, Keith Adams, directly at k-a-d-a-m-s at gatesair.com. That's me. All right. Uh, thanks again, everybody. I think we're going to uh, wrap this one up. And uh, thanks again for attending this Gates Air Connect webinar. And remember to join us for the next one um, in the series, which is um, Essential AOIP with Intraplex IP Link 100 on Thursday, August 30th. I'm pretty sure it'll be the same time of day, uh, 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, so for Steve Rossiter, this is Keith Adams signing off. Thanks again, Steve. Um, we'll see everybody next time. And hey, let's stay connected. <laughs>